and uh, thank you for being here uh, for our talk today. Uh, we're going to get started in a few moments. Uh, I want to welcome, welcome you all to uh, our, I think this is our fourth book talk uh, of the semester so far. Um, and uh, today, the book we're talking about today is uh, brand spanking new. I think this is the first uh, event Alana's done uh, since the book has come out. Uh, hopefully, uh, some of you were able to get a copy beforehand. We had some available. If not, uh, I've got two copies that are going to be available for the first two people who ask a question <laughs> that don't already have a copy. You should auction them off. Highest bidder. No, no, no. <laughs> we're not in this to make money. This is the money making. Thank you. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Ryan. I'm the associate director here at the Kevorkian Center. Uh, if uh, you heard about us from somewhere other than our website, please check out our website. We have a whole lot more events coming up uh, next month. Uh, I think our next event is next Friday with Tarek al Aris about his new book on uh, leaks, hacks, and scandals in uh, the Arab world. Uh, and so uh, hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, and so without uh, much further ado, I'm going to in introduce uh, our speakers today and then just a quick reminder of the format and we'll get started. Uh, so, uh, the reason we're here is Professor Alana Feldman, uh, who's a professor of anthropology, history, and international affairs, triple threat, uh, <laughs> at uh, George Washington University. Uh, her research has uh, focused on the Palestinian experience, both inside and outside of Palestine, examining uh, practices of government, humanitarianism, policing, displacement, and citizenship. So she is the author of Governor Gaza, Bureaucracy, Authority, and the Work of Rule, 1917 to 1967. Uh, she's also the author of In the Name of Humanity, The Government of Threat and Care, which she co-edited with our discussant uh, here today, Miriam Tickton, and Police Encounters, Security, Surveillance, uh, Security and Surveillance in Gaza under Egyptian Rule. Uh, and Alana is also a, a former Kevorkian uh, person. She also has an MA from our MA program and was formerly a faculty fellow here. So this is, a, I think, you know, a, a really exciting thing to have her back <laughs> here. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Miriam Tickton, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the New School for Social Research. She was the chair of anthropology uh, from 2016 to 2018. Congratulations on surviving that. And uh, co-director of the Zolberg Center on Global Migration between 2013 and 2016. She was the director of gender studies from 2012 to 2013. <laughs> Admit, ad, it, it's, it's, I respect. <laughs> she received her PhD in anthropology uh, at Stanford University and uh, the Ecole de Etudes and Sciences Sociales. Sorry, my French is terrible. Uh, in uh, Paris, France, and an MA in English literature from Oxford, uh, where she was also a Rhodes Scholar. Um, before coming to the New School, Miriam was an assistant professor in women's studies and anthropology at the University of Michigan and has held a postdoctoral position in the Society of Fellows at Columbia University. So today's format, like it has been at our book talks previously, uh, I'm going to ask Alana to introduce the film. Of, from, <laughs> she, has, she has images. Uh, it's hard. It's uh, it, to introduce the book for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, followed by a series of questions and conversations between Miriam and Alana, after which we will open up uh, to questions. So without any further ado, please let, allow me to welcome Alana Feldman and Miriam Tickton. Um, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for coming. And it really is a delight for me to get to be back here um, and, and talk about this book with you. Uh, so I do uh, have some images because I think that that can sometimes be helpful. Um, I, I usually like to start with these uh, with images of refugee camps now. And I suspect that many people in this audience are familiar um, with the fact that Palestinian refugee camps, like many other refugee camps that exist for a long period of time don't look the ways that, that people might imagine refugee camps as looking. Um, and I, I, one of the reasons I like to start with that is because I uh, encountered in my efforts to gain funding for this research project, um, which I got, um, I encountered in, in an NSF uh, application for funding, one reviewer responded by saying, well, you know, so a project on humanitarianism, but all good, interesting, um, but uh, why study the pathological 
case. Mm. Um, you know, Palestinians are not refugees um, because they are not going home, mm. um, and the places where they live are not camps. They look like slums anywhere else. Um, and there's a certain resonance to that discourse right now, which maybe we can talk about later. But um, you know, aside from what I um, and I would say I got the I got the grant in the end because the other reviewers had a different perspective. <laughs> um, but aside from the the potential sort of political underpinnings of a claim like that, it actually does, um, it, it both misunderstands but uh, reproduces a very common understanding of, of what it means to, for people to live in a, in a humanitarian space, what refugee camps are like, what humanitarianism is all about, um, and uh, we tend to think of, of all of these things as um, sort of in the moment and very crisis oriented and very ephemeral. Um, and clearly you can see, you know, over time, camps do not become just regular spaces, but they become very different from the kinds of spaces that they are when they begin. So, you know, the, some Palestinian refugee camps began in ways that are very much like the classic um, camp. Um, the photo on the left, uh, which is from the American Friends Service Committee archives, that's a uh, Shotzi camp in Gaza, and the big tent in the Friends is being used as a school. And then this photo is from the ICRC. Uh, photo archives. But then also you had some camps that um, began, uh, were sort of repurposed former military bases, so you had that in different places where um, Palestinians were refugees, and then both, um, you know, there's sort of a, a process of change over time, and also as some camps came in later, you have these kind of prefab shelters. So there's lots of different kinds of architecture um, that have made up camps. And then, of course, back to um, more more recent <coughs> pictures, and then some sort of interiors of the camps. And I think that you can see um, that changes in camps over time are one window, one way of looking at the transformations in the humanitarian condition over the long term. Um, and just to emphasize that. The, that long-term displacements so of Palestinians have been displaced for 70 years now. Long, that is on the kind of one end of a spectrum of, of longevity, but long-term displacement is a very common refugee experience. So the UNHCR estimates that about two-thirds of, uh, of refugees experience protracted displacement. So I think when we think about conditions of displacement and humanitarian responses to displacement and the experience of living as a refugee, it's important that we, you know, as scholars, practitioners, and publics, we need to recognize that long-term humanitarian presence is not, in fact, exceptional. So this is, there's all sorts of things that are distinctive about the Palestinian experience and in all aspects, but I, I think like anybody who works on Palestine, sort of constantly confronting the, the need to try to de-exceptionalize this account. So yes, it, it is, there are many things that are distinctive. Uh, but it is not exceptional, and it is not beyond the, the, the realm of thinking comparatively and thinking, thinking about how it might relate to other, other cases. <coughs> so, you know, my, so the book um, is an account of the Palestinian refugee experience with living within, living in relation to, living sometimes against a humanitarian assistance apparatus over seven decades. And in the book, I explore two uh, related sets of questions. One, protesting about trying to think about what happens to humanitarianism as it becomes long-term. So how does a form of intervention that does that is sort of self-conceived by most humanitarian practitioners as meant to be a response to crisis in short term, um, how does it confront uh, the ch how it needs to, how how people need to act and what is possible as it confronts chronic conditions as much as crisis situations. So how is humanitarian purpose challenged in those circumstances? How is it redefined? Um, how are humanitarian mandates and constituencies stretched and reconfigured and then also limited by those things? And then my second set of questions is about Palestinians and their experience. So how do Palestinians who have lived with humanitarianism pursue their lives and politics in this context, right? In, in a humanitarian condition and in relation to a humanitarian apparatus. So in what ways do humanitarian procedures, discourses, and materials 
provide tools for as much as impediments to making claims and living lives. Right? We've had a lot of um, focus, I think, in the scholarship on humanitarianism on the ways in which uh, humanitarian frames are disenabling uh, for people who live within them. And there are lots of ways in which they are, but one of the things that you find is that when people are living with them, because that's, that's what the circumstances are, people also do all sorts of other things with them and aren't, don't simply succumb to the limits of the frameworks. So I'm thinking about sort of throughout both a humanitarian politics of life, which I think we're, you know, is a term we're all we're for broadly familiar with, sort of thinking about the governance of persons and populations through the management of aid delivery. But I'm also thinking about the politics of living um, within these humanitarian spaces. So how it is that people strive and survive, how they make claims, how they do, how they do a range of things. Um, so the I focus on um, it's a pretty broad ranging book, but it is. Let me, so I focus on you know, Palestinians, um, displaced Palestinians live across the globe, but I focus on the area of UNRWA operations. Um, and this is a, this map gives you a sense of the the refugee camps across the Middle East, and just sort of so you can orient yourself the size of the bubble is basically the population size of the camp. Um, so I'm considering all, all five areas of UNRWA operations, Gaza Strip, West Bank, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, um, and look across uh, the decades of displacement. When I started the project, I used to describe it as being 1948 to the present, um, but eventually there actually is sort of an ending point in that the, the effects of the war in Syria and the additional displacement and the, and the effects of that on, on Palestinian refugees in Syria is really not part of what, um, part of this project, um, as is inevitable. I talk about a little bit in the conclusion, or you sort of gesture to, but that really wasn't what I, what I was um, looking at. So there is a, there is a temporal ending point. Um, and um, so I, I, this is a, both a historical and an ethnographic project. And so I did archival research. The UNRWA archive is kind of the center of, of that um, record as UNRWA is the, also the center of the humanitarian apparatus, but in the book and in my research, I was not looking only at UNRWA. Right? So UNRWA is kind of the central axis because it is everywhere and across the decades, but in each field and in each time, there are different organizations that are also working, working there. So I looked at, um, again, ICRC, American Friends Service Committee, the League of Red Cross Societies, different, different archival records that have an, a uh, more limited scope um, in terms of involvement. And then I did um, field work in four refugee camps primarily. I mean, I went to others, but I was primarily focused on four camps, Jeddah, Wihdat, Burj Barajne, and Dehesha in three fields of operation. So Jordan, Lebanon, um, and the West Bank. And in the camps, I interviewed hundreds of people, both refugees from multiple generations and humanitarian workers, and of course, in this context, as in many others, there are many people who occupy both those sort of cat positions. Um, the vast majority of humanitarian workers who provide aid to Palestinians are themselves Palestinian. Um, and then I observed a number of different humanitarian projects in action. Um, and so again, just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that I was looking at and where I was looking at them, I was looking at um, both a lot of different Projects, but also a lot of different kinds of humanitarian organizations. So, you know, in Burj Barajne, I looked at an MSF, Doctor Without Borders, mental health project. So MSF is a major international humanitarian organization. Um, but also in the same camp, I was looking at, at projects being done by very local Palestinian um, uh, founded and run um, NGOs, uh, UNRWA projects, um, in the Jeddah camp, a Muslim Brotherhood supported. Um, Center and there's uh, in West that one of the projects that I looked at was a sort of Christian volunteer, very self self defined Christian uh, volunteer project. So lots of so different um, different different projects and different kinds of work. Um, and so in trying to put all of this together, and I'll say that you know when I was doing the research for this project, people people would often say, oh this. Yeah, this seems really, this, that's a really complicated project and really difficult to do. And I was like, oh yeah, I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's fine. And actually doing the research was a, 
a lot of work, but uh, was not nearly as complicated as trying to then craft an account from all of all of this um, all of this stuff. So um, that that was that was one of the challenges. Um, but in so doing, I, I develop a set of arguments um, in thinking about the intersection of the politics of life and the politics of living um, in these camps and, and across these decades. Uh, so one is around the notion of thinking about um, punctuated humanitarianism. Um, and I sort of use this concept, develop this concept to try to think about the move between um, what we can think of as the humanitarian situation, right, the emergency crisis that, that demands a response, and then the more extended humanitarian condition, um, which is, you know, as displacement and need extends over time, the kind of chronic conditions that emerge, but which are still shaped by the fact of displacement and the fact of the camp and the, the fact of people being refugees. So there's this broad, in some sense, a broad shift from the situation to the condition, from the crisis to the chronic, but there is also a sort of repeated move back and forth between them. Right? There's not a linear trajectory. Condition, chronic conditions are regularly um, punctuated by returned emergencies, returned crises that then mandate a, a different kind of response. And so I use the term punctuated humanitarianism to try to capture these kind of shifting rhythms of change from slow and nearly imperceptible to sudden and dramatic, the varieties of efforts to respond, um, and then also the disruptions that they produce. And this kind of um, movement, punctuated humanitarianism, the punctuated humanitarian condition, has effects on both providers and recipients that they, they have to grapple with. One, for providers, um, the what you find at, as crises sort of ebb into the chronic is that there's a real question about humanitarian purpose, right? Need is evident, still is evident, but what it is that humanitarians can do to respond to that need becomes much less clear. If people are not at immediate risk of dying, but also you can't do that much to dramatically change the conditions in which people live, what do you do? Um, so the chronic is a, creates a real problem of purpose. And in fact, the return of crisis actually energizes and in some sense motivates humanitarians. I'm not su suggesting that they like it when there's a crisis, but it is a, is a focusing event. Um, but at the same time, people are tremendously frustrated by the sort of repeated cycles of destruction. I mean, you, you see um, that people, that humanitarian agencies and actors are regularly having to go after, you know, a, a spate of violence and see, like, what's left? What's left of that school that we built, that well that we helped support, and what are we going to have to do to sort of redo it all again? And so there's, there's a tremendous frustration um, that goes along with that. And then in these moves between the crisis and the chronic, there are repeated and, and um, of course, different in, in different circumstances, limits of access, right? So violence sometimes makes it impossible to access people. Again, limits of capacity, um, both in terms of limits of, of financial resources, but also <laughs> limits in terms of what humanitarianism can do for people. And then for recipients, um, at these, as these circumstances change, uh, people move in and out of different relationships to a humanitarian apparatus, which is itself changing. So people need, uh, People's need is often uh, continuous or continuing, but it is but it is not the same. Right? And what is available to meet, to meet needs is also changing. Um, and so people struggle with the fact that they may not be able to be reached, um, or they may not be able to be helped. So, you know, for example, just uh, when I was talking to people in Wehdet, so a camp in East Amman, um, which at this point is very much you know, integrated into the city. Uh, and so doing research there in, you know, 2011, 2012, many people that I talked to profess quite limited relation to humanitarian services. Um, even as they were living in a camp and often sent their children to UNRWA schools and received health care from UNRWA clinics. But what felt to them to be their most acute problems, poverty and lack of opportunity, they managed on their own. So there's a sense of a receding humanitarian presence as, you know, as kind of chronic 
conditions um, persisted. But you know, if we can go back to with that at an earlier time, in the aftermath of Black September, with that and other refugee camps, also Jedi where I worked, were um, real centers of this conflict and um, suffered tremendous damage, and then generated a you know a robust humanitarian response. So this is this is an example of one sort of moment of um, of the of crisis and then response punctuating a kind of um, ongoing condition. And then in terms of thinking about sort of the poli refugee politics um, in this context, um, I've been thinking about this politics as discordant. Um, and again, I use that term to try to capture both the multiplicities of refugee politics, right, that it's, there are multiple registers, aims, and tactics, and also to capture the real tensions among them. So it's not just that people are asking for different things and doing different things, but there's a real felt tension between those different needs and, and demands. Um, so you see on the one hand um, that refugees, um, you know, the refugee category is named as a suffering subject and there is the idea that suffering must be responded to, but this is really only one of the registers of refugee politics. Uh, people also name the refugee as a rights-bearing category. Um, there's a politics of aspiration, a politics of existence and of refusal. And in making political demands, people address both a near and distant future, close and far places, and goals of different grandeur, so liberation versus improvement. And this is one of the real tensions that runs throughout this, which is, is are, are our politics directed at Palestine and at the question of return and ultimate liberation? Or, and it's not really an or, that's the point, it's, an, it's persistently an and, are our politics directed at having greater opportunities also where we are now, um, different lives in the places where we live. And so this image just, you know, why is it relevant to, to my talk about discord politics? This is an image of, from Ida camp in the West Bank of people being moved from tents into shelters. And these are keys, these are not keys to homes in Palestine. These are, I mean, they're in Palestine, but not keys to their original homes, but keys to the, the somewhat more permanent shelters that they are that they are getting. And so this question of sort of improved living conditions is one of the one of the tensions that that runs through refugee politics. And um, and this politics is in you know, sometimes in accordance with a sort of national Palestinian national um, nationalist voice and sometimes in tension with it. And also in um, confrontation with uh, the host countries where they live. Um, and I realize I'm already talking longer than I intended to, so I'll try to just say a few more things so we can um, get to discussion. So one of the things that I think about is the uh, refugee category as a sort of site and basis for politics. Um, and there is a, I don't know, it's a paradox or certainly a tension around the fact that a category that is meant to be non-political, um, and that's particularly meant to provide you know, limited protections but not, um, not political rights, um, provides a basis and a space for political action and for political subjectivity for Palestinians. And um, one of the things that, that refugee politics um, through the refugee category, because right, you can imagine, and there certainly has been, lots of politics by refugees that is either not in relation to the refugee category, that's, in relation, that's framed in relation to other categories, or that stands against the category, but there is also a lot of politics that is, that is expressed through the category. That is, as refugees, we have demands. As refugees, um, we, are, we have a politics. And there's been a real claim that the, the refugee category should be seen as um, world forming in and of itself. And this is sort of in contrast to, to people like Hannah Arendt who des described the, the refugee category, the refugee position as world poor only. Um, and I'll just say one more thing. The other thing that I, that I try to look at is the, the variety of forms of politics um, 
that that you see in humanitarian spaces and through humanitarian categories, and these include both protests and petitions. This again, this is a photo from the American Friends Service Committee archives, um, which is captioned by uh, you know in the archive is captioned dealing with a riot. Um, I mean, it doesn't really seem like a riot, um, but it but it seems like people asking for things. So you have protests and petitions. You have people. Um, just making changes, uh, making changes to camp infrastructure, making changes to their lives um, without um, without seeking you know permission, and then you have a series of rights claims that that are made also through um, through through and through and to humanitarian actors. So both rights to humanitarianism and specifically in the, uh, an insistence that that um, that um, that UNRWA's presence and is, is a recognition of international responsibility um, for, uh, for the fate of Palestinians. Um, and people also make uh, claims of, uh, in terms of humanitarian rights. Um, and the idea of, and here it's both that um, there are, that they're, they're, I mean, they're, the question of what might constitute humanitarian rights is a very unsettled and uh, inchoate um, Idea. Both there is an internet. There is an international set of rights that one might be able to claim rights um, to protection, rights not to, to be further displaced. Um, but Palestinian refugees also try to expand the sense of what kinds of responsibilities UNRWA and, and other humanitarian organizations might have to them, and so claim, in some sense, rights to national representation as a humanitarian obligation. Um, and so that's part of what I'm talking about there. And I think since I've talked longer than I intended to, I will stop here. I guess I just launched into it. Yeah, okay. But thank you so much. That was fabulous. It's a delight to be here and to be in dialogue with Ilana. As you can tell, we've been we've had a long, ongoing conversation since 2002. <laughs> well, um, and I'm still learning with and from her. So it's, it's great to be able to to talk about this book. Um, as you could tell from Ilana's presentation, it's really an epic book. It's an epic historical ethnography because it covers 70 years, three countries, four camps. I mean, it's huge. Um, and it really confirms her, I think, as a leading scholar of humanitarianism, both its potentials and its, and its limits. Um, it gives us brilliant insights, I think, into the temporality of humanitarian living um, as punctuated and oscillating. Uh, as changing but never linear, and it rewrites the debates on politics and the politics of humanitarianism, showing that refugees are always engaged in altering their worlds, even if this, this doesn't appear as a radical break with the present. So, I, you know, I don't want to say a lot, but I do want to kind of again point to some of the kind of what I see as the key interventions. And I am not a specialist of the Middle East <laughs> nor of Palestine, so I speak to it as somebody who works on humanitarianism. So I, there's a lot, obviously, about Palestinian life um, and in, in incredibly rich detail of this. Um, I will focus again on the humanitarian stuff. So as Ilana said, you know, I think there are two major interventions to me in this book. And one is about the question of the temporality, again, of humanitarianism. Um, you know, humanitarianism in the way that we think of it, I think in general, whether accurate or not, is about the temporal present. You know, it's about the moment of crisis. It's about the time of emergency. And yet, I mean, as you said, there's a whole, there's so many refugees and situations, protracted life in the camps. So it's a wonderful um, example of 70 years of humanitarian life. It's just, it blows your mind. It makes you rethink really what humanitarianism is. And so I know it's both... Palestinian life as exception, but also, as you said, really makes us think, rethink humanitarianism more broadly. Um, its mandate, its reach, its challenges, and so on. Um, so the second area that I think it makes a major contribution in is on the question of the relationship between humanitarianism and politics. Because again, um, humanitarianism is usually seen as outside of politics. It claims to be outside of politics. It claims neutrality and partiality, precisely about to go do its work and not, um, and not challenge the nation states in which it's doing its work. Um, but as the humanitarian condition endures, it inevitably becomes political. Um, and the, and the nature of the political um, claims, as Ilana said, are um, 
are related to the temporality of it. So is it about the near future? Is it about the present? Is it about the future generations? You know, how, how are politics understood and conceived? And these are often uh, coming to um, tension and contradiction. Um, in the kind of the, the field of, of um, humanitarianism and politics, I think, um, you know, Ilana really carves out a space between Hannah Arendt's theories of politics as a field of action, as a field of activity, as making meaningful um, activity in the world, um, and Jacques Rancière's idea about politics as disruption, as dissensus, as, as, um, as revolution. In, in some senses. So there's she's looking for an in-between space to understand this, something between um, survival and endurance, really. Um, so I guess I will ask questions uh, along the lines first about politics and then about temporality, even though, of course, these are related. Um, so come to, I mean, you covered a lot of this already, but I'm just going to kind of ask you to exp like, elaborate on it. But for instance, when we think of Palestinian politics, as you said, I think a lot of people think about the right of return, about liberation, about restoration. And, um, and in the first section of the book, you say that possibility in politics aren't always um, addressed uh, to this exit strategy as an exit from the condition that one, you know, one is in. So I wanted you to talk more about how, why and how you see this as politics and whether the refugees you worked with saw it as politics? Did they define it as politics? Did they find it as in the humanitarian realm? Um, and I guess along those same lines, because I think it's the similar kind of a question, you say that um, refugee politics and national politics, Palestinian national politics, are not identical. And um, I wanted to hear more about that and thinking about who leads in these debates, who's disciplining whom, who's the authentic subject here, who gets to speak and um, and with what legitimacy in that, in that case. Um. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, um, so there's sort of two parts to the, to the question of, like, thinking about the, the doing politics as a refugee that's not only about not being a refugee, right? Because, of course, that is the ultimate goal, right? Bah, bah, you know, Palestinians would want not to be refugees, but they don't want to not be refugees through a kind of dissolution of, of that category or a dissolution of their status. I mean, the, I, I, as people here are probably very familiar with all of the, the discourse around the idea of settlement, Peltin, and, that, and the ways in which that you could, that there are pressures, multiple kinds, and again, we confront this very publicly right now, to to end without resolving the Palestinian um, uh, question. So, so that is one reason why, and here is a place where I think refugee, you know, there is an alignment in some sense. That's one reason why it's very important for people to make claims as refugees, because it's actually important to continue to be recognized as a refugee uh, uh, until, the until the political issue is resolved. And this, in some sense, is fits, it fits easily and discomfort and, and not easily with the, with the humanitarian paradigm. Mm -hmm. Because humanitarian actors certainly would say, we do, we separate these things. Right? We will provide, we, our aim is to provide assistance and support to populations in need un, until such time as other people resolve, I mean, this is a general thing, resolve the circumstances that, that, that create that need. And so one of the things that, that Palestinians have insisted on, um, and not they alone, but Palestinians have insisted on, is to, be, to continue to be recognized as, as refugees um, until that is resolved, and, but that, and to continue to live as refugees. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this becomes then a space where there is a lot of tension, mm -hmm. not a tension betwe between, within a Palestinian community, between differently located Palestinian communities, and tensions beyond between uh, Palestinian refugee populations and host countries and others. Because what does it mean to live as a refugee? Um, should you live um, only in relation to some other time? You know, that is the past that you had and the future that you will have, but not live in relation to the present or the near future? Um, should you try to live as well as you can whenever, both for yourself and for your community, so you are better placed to, to act politically. 
Um, and, I mean, and these are questions that don't have a simple resolution, right? They, run, they persist uh, throughout. But one of the things that I certainly found in, in the course of doing field work is that things that, from certain perspectives, might seem impossible to hold together, right? You, you know, um, there's a discourse about Palestinian refugees and about Camp Light that's, that would say, well, people re refuse any change because they just are holding on to this, this hopeless dream of return, or, or you know, or it's opposite, or whatever. And what you find when you talk to people is that, I mean, in some sense, this really shouldn't be surprising, and yet I think it is so surprising, is that people have multiple desires, multiple mm -hmm. political desires, and act politically in, uh, in multiple registers and multiple frameworks at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it's not a source of tension to people um, living in refugee camps, but it's not an impossible tension, which it, I think it sometimes seems from, from other perspectives, and people really do try to, um, are, are, are able to say, I have a right um, to, to opportunity now. And actually, this quote, which so it's, I, the, surrounding the text that I've given you in this quote is a, is a longer statement about um, demand for um, employment opportunity, right? So people you know, make those demands, and they see those demands as not just alongside their bigger claims, but connected to them mm -hmm. in some sense. So there's this, um, but, but I do, I mean, part of the reason why I use the term discordant to, de to describe that is that I don't want to suggest that it's, that it's, it's a frictionless combination of just a you know, multiplicity of things. There's, there is all sorts of friction, and, pe and you see it within families, mm -hmm. right, where people, you know, um, worry about what, how the, what their children are going to be like, how, what kinds of Palestinian subjects they're going to be down the road. You see it within communities where people um, you know, confront different choices that people are making about um, how to live. And of course, you see it across these kinds of geographies. Did I, did I leave part of your question? To the was the okay. conflict between refugees and nationalists? Politics? Oh, yeah. So this is, I mean, this is, this is part of it, that sometimes there are some moments where from a certain, um, a certain you know, sort of official nationalist perspective, refugees, the idea of, of living well now or living well soon can, can be in tension with that, with that discourse. Right. Great, yeah. Yeah, so they're obviously, you know, creating new political worlds and new kind of uh, grammars, which is the thing that I found, another thing I found super interesting about this. So, you know, part of the problem with the humanitarian world and the way we talk about it, I think, is that our affective grammars are limited. So we talk about compassion, we talk about pity, we talk about sympathy, whatever, and um, there's not a whole lot of space for other discussions of political sentiments, right? But the book, you bring up a ton of these. Um, so like in your chapter five, you, you lay out what I see as an expanded political grammar, right? So it's, you talk about sumud, you talk about armed struggle or fedayim, how do you, <laughs> how would you say that? Fedayim. Fedayim, fedayim okay. And um, refusal, you know, refusal of normalization, martyrdom, nonviolent resistance. This is a whole kind of set of new grammars, I think, not new, but they're ones that have been suppressed. Um, when we talk about humanitarianism, when we talk about the political possibilities out there and the ways of feeling. Um, so I guess my question is, are you, is this a set of political grammars that you are offering up in some sense? Is it specific to the Palestinian struggle? Or do you think that this is something we can circulate, amplify more broadly to enrich uh, our ability to act beyond the humanitarian, um, I guess beyond humanitarian limits beyond the kind of familiar affective terrain. Yeah. yeah, I mean I think and this is this this is sort of always the the question like what is how far do, do a set of concepts and a set of insights from, from a, a particular setting and a setting that is as I started by saying often seen as exceptional travel. And you know I don't I don't propose a model for mm -hmm. for other circumstances, but I do think that we can learn a lot from the ways in which both Pal Palestinian refugees have um, acted politically in the kinds of terms of, of their politics, but also the ways in which humanitarian actors have encountered that politics as we think about other, other settings. Right? So one of the things that, that is very striking to me is that the, um, 
the the language of the language of suffering and compassion is um, and is only is really only one strand. It's it is a, it is a strand that has been significant in in Palestinian discourse, and especially sort of in, in in recent years, it has been. Um, and sometimes more dominant than at, than at some other times, like this mm -hmm. sort of e this effort to gain a t a international attention and response to a political circumstance through the language of suffering, that this, this suffering should not be allowed to continue. And of course it shouldn't, um, but uh, we have a lot of, there's a lot of evidence of lots of other kinds of registers of, of making those claims, and, and not just, not just, Beyond the humanitarian framework, so you see, you see people making arguments that there are one that there are human, humanitarian obligations, and this is not something that emerges only from a Palestinian circumstance. And I think lots of humani there are d different kinds of humanitarian organizations have different kinds of mandates, but there are there are a set of obligations that that um, come with with uh, with humanitarian action that that certainly the Palestinians have been. Um, both highly attentive to, and also have sought to amplify, right? You know, mm -hmm. so that that in in insisting that UNRWA's presence, about which people feel extremely conflicted. Mm. So again, just like there's a there's a conflict over politics, people feel very conflicted about UNRWA as an institution and about humanitarianism as a practice. So on the one hand, mm. um, you know this. The, you know, a statement like this, that UNRWA's presence is an acknowledgement and a recognition by the international community of, of responsibility for the, for the Palestinian plight, but also for the situation. Right? That there isn't, um, and then at the same time, you know, or you know, other people, or the same people at different times will also say that UNRWA's presence and humanitarian presence is a mechanism to try to um, Evacuate Palestinian politics, right? To you know, to sort of have people you know, run after the flour sack instead of focus on political organization. So there's not a single meaning for Palestinians of you know UNRWA's presence or other humanitarian organizations. So UNRWA has a particular importance, not just because of of its longevity and wide presence, but precisely because of it, the the kind of its UN mandate and that it it, it seems to be tied to a uh, UN recognition or uh, recognition of international responsibility, but there's um, I lost track of where I was. Saying, but there, it is an ex there is not a single a single meaning or impact of of the humanitarian frame, but it is not. So even as it is, even as people feel conflicted about it and worry about the consequences of both humanitarian uh, assistance over time, but of the humanitarian framework. O over time, it is very clearly not only um, a a question of suffering and, and mm -hmm. compassionate response. For mm -hmm. people. Yeah. So I, again, I think that's a huge contr you know contribution of the book to show that in humanitarian life there are multiple sentiments, you know, commitments mm -hmm. and um, feelings that are circulating: anger, frustration, whatever. Which again, don't get talked about a lot. I think with humanitarianism. Pardon me, but would it be possible to read out the quote at the top? I'm not sure if people in the back of the room can yeah. read it. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Um, so this one says, UNRWA does not represent a humanitarian service given to refugees. The services given to us are our right. Our problem is created by the international community, and they are responsible for solving it. UNRWA has a political dimension rather than a humanitarian one. Um, so I feel like I was going to come to this at the end, but I feel like this opens the question of UNRWA right now uh -huh. um, and the, you know the withdrawal of funding and the, um, it's under siege and so can you talk a little bit about this and, and how it's playing out in Palestine what you think the consequences are where, where this is going to lead yeah. um, so I would you know there where we'll leave what to see but um, I mean in some sense this is what I mean and, and I, again I expect many people here are, are familiar, familiar with this the, the targeting of UNRWA is part of a broad targeting of, of all Palestinian institutions and all Palestinian efforts to accomplish anything. You know, so, and so again, there's an interesting <coughs> thing here in that UNRWA is not a Palestinian institution. Mm -hmm. It is an international institution, and yet it is a Palestinian institution, mm -hmm. right? And so like, it's, not, uh, it's, it's obviously not a, a mistake that it's been targeted. It is also quite the specific, the language with which the administration announced its um, 
uh, withholding of funding is um, it's kind of it's a culmination of a long-standing um, effort, um, right-wing effort, you know, to basically what I was talking about before to accomplish the the dissolution of the Palestinian refugee category and therefore the the <coughs> the shortcutting of a political process by simply taking questions off the table. There are, I mean, the, the idea that there are no Palestinian refugees, fundamentally, there's been, there's been a long-term effort to have, um, to sort of require the State Department um, to define a Palestinian refugee as only somebody who themselves departed in 1948. Um, of course, it's not up to the State Department, in fact, to define a Palestinian refugee. But there is also the claim that is made is that, that the, again, that there is an exceptionality here, that it is only Palestinians for, for whom refugee status would pass down um, to children. And that is certainly not true. Um, the UNHCR um, pro registers children who are born as refugees as well. Uh, but there, but it, in, in an... I, Ironic way, or I don't know if it's an ironic way. It is not that that you know, Palestinians have seen UNRWA as politically important to them, um, and UNRWA is being attacked partly because it is politically important to them. Um, but if we want to um, defend UNRWA and argue, and, and argue for for U.S. funding, I should say that in the short term, at least, the funding gap is being is currently being filled, but largely. Um, by other countries who have stepped up. Um, so this is also part of a much broader, you know, administration effort to sort of rem shed itself of what it sees as any kind of sort of global commitments. Mm -hmm. um, but um, mm -hmm. in but yeah, in wanting to argue against this, I think we also you know the uh, the like th there's been a letter from a number of Democratic congressmen saying you know, we need to support this funding. For out of grounds of compassion and sense that out of because of humanitarian need and because of the potential security consequences hmm. um, of of destabilization, and I would argue that you know we whoever that we is those of us who are a different perspective than Congress um, what should 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 not shy away from the political from the political significance of of a. Of a Hmm. The existence of an organization like this, even though it is not political, right? it has political significance, but it is not political in that you know, it, in to the extent that it genu that UNRWA does not uh, have a mandate, nor does it try to determine a resolution to this situation. I mean, it, within UNRWA, there has been it has been uh, impossible, and you, and again, this is another thing that I think speaks to humanitarian encounters yeah. in many circumstances, it's not possible to ignore refugee politics, right? Because people put to demands to UNRWA and UNRWA's practice has changed over the years in response to things that refugees have done, um, including a refusal of resettlement, but also a demand for protection, which was not part of UNRWA's mandate when it was established. And that's a sort of general, a much broader, that is a general part of many humanitarian missions. And UNHCR is a protection agency. UNRWA was not. But it has expanded its mandate to include protection, and that's in part in response to, to demands. Hmm. Yeah, so in some ways, I mean, it's a particular case, but it does reflect the condition of humanitarian aid in the world, which is, politi is seen as political. It can be seen as political, whether the organizations claim to be or not, right? Like MSF, similarly, you know, they get killed, they get um, kicked out, whether even though they claim neutrality as UNRWA. Right. You know, and yeah, and does. there's just, you know, the. The, the humanitarian agencies and often supporters would want to want to preserve. I mean, the whole idea is we preserve this space that is beyond politics, outside of politics. Not because politics is not important, but because that's not our mandate. Right. And if poli if we are seen as political, our ability to do our job will be diminished. And so, you can understand why why MSF or UNRWA might hold that position. But as interested observers, I think we. We can't really shy away from right. the fact that they, again, not that the agencies have political mandates, but that there are political effects and that these are spaces yeah. of politics, yeah. spaces where politics happens, right. um, which is different than them having a particular political program that they're trying to implement. Right. And now that's a discussion that's forced on us because they're being defunded, right? So. 
Um, okay, so I have two more questions, and, and then we can open it up. But um, these were more about the question of the temporality. And again, I, it's really, it really does change everything, I think, thinking of it as a humanitarian condition, which Ilana does in reference to Hannah Arendt's human condition, right? Um, so in the last, oh no, in chapter six, you talk about death and dying in the humanitarian condition, and everything about humanitarianism is profoundly about life, really. It's about protecting life in the most basic sense, right? Um, but it is also, as you said, about stopping suffering. So sometimes stopping suffering can be through death, right? Um, so I wonder if, if anyone talked about this, actually, about stopping suffering through death. I mean, partly what, what's in the book is that there's a limit to life expectancy. So as soon as somebody hits 60, which is amazing how they've decided this, they're like not really given any other care except for just primary care, like no cancer care, no W. I I mean, they're just, they're, they're not seen as important, the valuation of life. It's like, you know, it's about triage in some senses. So, so in that sense, death becomes part of the humanitarian main mandate insofar as we're not gonna help you live, right? Mm -hmm. But then how about actually engaging with the people who, who are suffering and wanna die? You know? Is that taken on at all? By humanitarian organizations? Um, I don't think so. I don't know, I mean, it's a great, I, it's a question I don't have an empirical answer. I don't really know. I mean, you know, what I was very struck by, I'm gonna, I'm gonna circle, since I don't, I'm, I'll circle around your question and then maybe we'll see if I can come up with something to say about it. Um, but, but I'll, to just say a little bit about what, what I was, what I was sort of grappling with is precisely the, the ways in which, one of the challenges for, uh, for long-term humanitarianism and for humanitarianism in the sort of this, the, con the chronic condition is grappling with a set of needs that are evident and real and that humanitarian organizations recognize as real but that don't really fit within a humanitarian paradigm. So, you know, the needs of old age right. um, and, and the kinds of illnesses that can come with that or other kind of chronic illnesses are very, um, you know, they don't, they, they're, they have a complexity, a different kind of complexity than than of than a, than crisis response, and they don't they don't fit very easily within um, within humanitarian frameworks. And then they really also push the 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 resource limits. So there's multiple kinds of limits, right? A limit of thinking about what it is that that is a humanitarian response, right? Is is dealing with you know. Um, just the, with the needs of the elderly, a humanitarian response, or is it a different kind of kind of care right. response? Um, and then, what what kinds of resources might be required to respond adequately to those sorts of needs? Um, and that's one of the. the I mean, it's it's precisely for resource limits that there there were, um, and this was particularly in Lebanon, where, and it supposedly has changed, but it's it's when, when I was doing research there, the policy had you know. At policy level, supposedly it changed, but nobody that, that I was encountering with it in the camps had an experience of it being changed. That there was this cutoff of 60 as being in terms of what kinds of um, beyond primary care um, uh, you would be eligible for, or paid for by UNRWA, and that's a you know, that's a capacity limit. Um, and I'm now I've totally lost my train of thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and so you know the. Um, I mean, I was I was struck that for the most part. I mean, I still death itself seems um, beyond the humanitarian frame. I mean, mo certainly most people. When when I talk to people in in the camps, <clears throat> you know, like, what do you want? What do you need? What should the you be provided by humanitarian organizations? There was a there was a lot about the circumstances of of suffering and the conditions in, in which people are dying. Oh, this was what I was this was not a point that I was going to make, which is that not it's not the the circumstances in which people get old and get ill are shaped by the humanitarian condition. So it's not just that that these things are happening and they're refugees, but the ways in which people right. experience aging right. and the and the, the health in which they, they do so is, sh is directly connected to their circumstances. So even though it's it's hard to make a response, it is it is not in fact external to the kind to the kinds of things that people are confronting. But but by and large when people um, yeah they did yeah death itself I think I didn't see it as um, 
as some as inside the frame. But yeah, I mean, it would be a very that's a very good question to ask. I mean, partly just because you think like it is about what it means, what life means, mm -hmm. right? And humanitarianism tries to define that in terms of needs and and so on. And this is like I don't want to live in these conditions. I you know what, what is the meaning of life in this case and. And are they pushing it beyond that kind of a almost humanist sense, you know? But anyway, it's yeah, it's a really interesting raising these questions um, of where death fits. Is there assisted suicide, you know, and so on. Um, and so my last question is about again about hitting the limits here. And so in the book, you talk about future exhaustion, which I think is a really interesting term. It's like after the failure of revolutionary movements, after the failure of the PLO. Um, people, where is the future, right? And you give a couple of examples, but I, I guess the question is, can one live without reclaiming a future? You know, or were they living without hope of a future in the larger sense? Can one do that without having a future in mind? Did you encounter people like that? I mean, that, um, that sense, and this is something, again, you know, that there's not a linear trajectory here. So we have, there, there's sort of ups and downs um, in people's sense of, Possibility um, and optimism. Even I was just at a, at a workshop under the title of "Optimism at the End of the World," right. and that kind of right. is a little bit of what right. people have been experiencing. Mm. Um, but one of you, know, I definitely talked to lots of. So I the the that was in frame that by saying the moment where I was the years when I was doing research, as people are again probably very familiar with. This is this is a a pretty deep ebb. Um, for in the, in terms of Palestinian um, political energy and the sense of, of leadership and um, and in some sense future planning, yeah. right? And so there there certainly were people who would would sort of say you know the the the, the future is lost, right? And, the, and meaning the the future that we had imagined and hoped for, the future of a uh, a liberated future, a you know. A, a, where our community is reconstituted, um, and for some people, that sort of lo the loss of that future meant. Um, so I, you know, I'm going to turn in another direction, right? And I'm going to say, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to go to Palestine. I want to go to Europe, mm. you know. Um, mm. But that, you know, so so that is something mm. in in the air, but also in in the air is a very strong sense of the need to. To have to have new political thinking and new po political leadership and some some new f means of getting to a different kind of future planning and so I certainly heard a lot about that. There's also but there was also a real sense that that this is a moment, somewhat of a moment of, of being a bit stuck. Right? Mm. We we know we need it and we demand it, but how do we get there? Yeah. Um, but there, I think. Um, Like like everything, there's not a there's not a single valence to the to the sense of the how much the future feels available and how much it, and and um, how much it feels impossible. Right. Um, but but I do think that 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 the question of the future ru runs through everything, and this is another ways in which politics within the humanitarian condition is somewhat different than than might be expected because it is you know. Um, it is. It does directly engage the future, and again, not not just the future beyond and and no longer in reference to humanitarianism, but a future through it to maybe right. get to some other place. Right. Well, that's wonderful. I feel like we should open it up now to to questions. I think you're, you're, Miriam can. I can take them over. Okay. Them. So there was that right in the middle here. You had your hand up first. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your talk. I'm really um, eager to read the book. Um, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the sort of relationship between the actual humanitarian organization and politics, particularly um, as you know these humanitarian sites are becoming increasingly the sites of tar military targets. So one being you know Kunduz MSF's hospital that was bombed. Um, but also, you know, humanitarian organizations increasingly make more political claims, such as MSF saying, we're not going to take funding from the EU, um, given their refugee politics and immigration politics. So, um, I mean, I guess my question is, like, and, you know, as you've sort of done this ethnographic work and seen the shift in the 70, you know, within the seven years, um, you know, is it becoming increasingly hard to, you know, for humanitarian organizations to be like, 
there's this sort of separate realm where we just want to provide, you know, aid um, when like idea, like accessibility and like these very sites themselves are being implicated more and more in politics and becoming sites of targets. Well, it's and I, I, I fear that this is going to be the kind of answer that I give to everything. It's a bit of a back and forth, right? I don't think that, I don't think there is a um, a single direction. I mean, you certainly see, like in in the ar archival record from the from like 1949, 1950, some of the questions that and tensions that you see now, you see then. One of refugees insisting on um, on something more than they are being given, and that more is is multiple, right? More and better aid and Different, different kind of response, like a response that, that gets us home. And you see around these organizations other kind of pressures from other kinds of actors, um, host countries to sort of say, you know, we, we, you, this, we, this needs not just to be an aid operation, we need to be re responding to the political questions and humanitarian actors, you know, prior to UNRWA and then UNRWA saying, that's not our, that's not our mandate, this is what, this is what we do. But at the same time, seeing mandates shift in response to these kinds of political claims, right? So you know, even as that sort of, there is this persistent refusal of the political, it's always kind of creeping in. So that's not to say, like, it's just the same all the time, and, and you know, but I don't think there actually has ever been a, a moment where um, it has, where in fact it is possible to, to keep political questions um, really outside of the humanitarian frame, and and part of what the tension is at different points is like is this sort of expanding and shrinking of what what is seen as humani Thanks. the humanitarian, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? Exactly. Actually, had to, over there. Yeah. Yes. Um, what is the status of Unilever in Syria? Is it still operating at all? Yeah, it is. It is operating. Um, I think you know many of the camps have been um, either totally or largely depopulated, um, and there been, there certainly are times. And this is another instance where there are times when it is impossible to access people, but it but it can, but it does continue to well, operate. I understand a lot of Palestinians have disappeared along with the, the rebels. Um, also, I, there was something that I didn't understand in the narrative. Did you say that you know where it does not offer medical care? to people above 60? Um, it does. So this is in reference to um, uh, a policy that was in place in Lebanon for a number of years where the age, it was not that people were, did not get medical care, but above age 60, which actually is also the cutoff for employment, you know, uh, the UNRWA employment, like you know, that what people were eligible for in terms of more, more everybody's eligible for primary care. Um, but tertiary, secondary and tertiary care, cancer treatment, that as a matter of triage, um, that, that was not made available to people. And there was, a, there, there was a recognition that that was a problem. But, but that, does it pay for care in the local uh, hospitals when the person is under 60? A portion of the care. There was a, a few years ago that there was, uh, and this, this is, these kinds of policies are, all, are always changing. So just a couple of years ago, there was a another reconfiguration in UNRWA's um, policy in Lebanon where people had to pay a higher percentage of they get the, money? the and this is I mean so so in different fields there are different issues that are the things that people talk about the most like that you know and in Lebanon certainly the question of access to healthcare is. I mean, you as something that you hear about from everybody, um, well, and the and the limits of treats the refugees horribly. Not surprised. Thank you. Thanks, uh, yeah. Professor Public, for the book. I, I mean, for the talk. Congratulations on the book. Um, I'm curious, to what degree was BDS a relevant critical point or point of reference for uh, people in the camps for, for for these refugees, given that it's a, you know it's a political move, it's a politics of consumption. Um, and, and protest through strategic consumption, um, and in some ways it doesn't seem to fit or cohere with a humanitarian condition. Um, in some ways, so could you speak to that? Um, I think I'm, I well, I'll try to speak to the first part, and I might need you to say more about the second part of the what you see as a, a, a sort of the incoherence. I think, um, I mean, this was not a part. I, thought a lot about BDS in other contexts. This was not a part of my of my research project. 
Um, but I would say that certainly for, in some sense, the, the kinds of controversies that we have here about whether this is an appropriate tactic and what it, I mean are not, the idea of, of not engaging with Israel and Israeli institutions is kind of a, a, a baseline position for, for most, um, you know, for certainly places where I was working in Palestinian refugees and non-refugees. Um, so I don't see, how do, to, to tell me more about the, well, the just, conflict that you see. Because it's, it's a movement that um, is oriented around, um, you know, it's, it's not consuming products produced in the occupied territories. Um, it doesn't seem like something that, a, a movement that is, you know, um, it happens to the refugee camps could easily participate in, for instance. Given that humanitarian condition is one we associate with depredation, um, you know, lack of consumption, et cetera. So that's that's why that's okay. sort of what, what I had in mind. Well, but you know, interestingly, so this is another thing. You know, oh, and there's lots of consumption in the camps, right? Because there's these are again, that's part of the humanitarian right. condition is that there's an expansion of. I mean, there was always. Um, you know, even from the, so I'm going to do it again. I'm going to say some things that are only semi-responsive to your question, but that your question made me think about in terms of, in terms of consumption. <laughs> um, one of the things that is striking is that in the, you know, in sort of a crisis moment, right? So in this case, in the early days after 1948 or early after 1967, where there is a sort of large scale humanitarian response in terms of lo the provision of rations, the goods that are going to refugees. Even then, even when it was kind of a, a, a broad basket, um, it was n what was provided was never enough for people. It was too limited, both in kind, right? So vegetables and meat weren't provided. Um, and it was not, never enough in terms of substance. So people always had to find other ways to um, get goods, and enter into a market, and, and, and be involved in different kinds of consumptive, consumption practices. and, and uh, and um, a buying and selling of things, including buying, uh, including selling rations to get other kinds of things that you might need. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, certainly, people, um, and so you know, when you think about what the humanitarian apparatus becomes over decades, it it is not a apparatus that provides people with sort of their daily needs, right? It provides people with important things, but the stuff that you need to to maintain your life, you have to get on your own. Um, and so, um, can, you know, in that way, you know, consumption is a major part of camps. And also, there is an increasing, over the decades, class differentiation um, in the camps. And actually, mm -hmm. I can go, the very first picture, um, so this is with that camp, and actually, you know, I, this picture is come, I took from a, like a right-wing website that's trying to say, it's not a camp because look at these people with a store. Right. And my point is it is, they, yes, they have a store and it is a camp, right? right. Um, so, because all, all sorts of, we need to, ex rather than say no camps are just spaces where people, you know, are, are recipients of, of flour and can't do anything else, we need to recognize that camps are places where all sorts of things happen. So, um, so there are a range of reasons why people might, why people, what, I mean, I do think of, of BDS as more a, a movement, a solidarity movement than the, the ways that how, that Palestinians are pursuing their politics, but you know, consumption is all part of this landscape as well. In blue, yeah. And then the, yeah, and then the guy, uh, yeah, sorry. structures that often involve a lot of um, like international or foreign kind of like professionalized um, workers and kind of like the hierarchy, like if you experience like tensions in the hierarchy of that situation? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And so 95% of UNRWA staff are Palestinian refugees, so the vast majority of the staff are, but the leadership is, is always, there is kind of a, you know, a color bar. Um, and actually it also is a, uh, the, is connected to funding streams. So the all, UNRWA's budget is funded by voluntary contributions, hence this current conflict. But the very the top leadership positions are paid for out of the central um, budget. And there's a real sense it's it's you know it's not accidental that you know that that there's a sense that that the those 
face of UNRWA needs to be something other, somebody other than the refugees. But even beyond that high level, there's a tremendous amount of tension within um, UNRWA staff, within the Palestinian staff, um, about all sorts of things. Um, so um, let's give Jordan as an, as an example. Um, there's a sense um, that, that some camp residents have that those so people probably or may, may know Jordan is majority Palestinian, met, met much of that population re refugees um, and therefore eligible to work for UNRWA. Most of that population does not live in camps. Much of that population, highly educated, well off. And so there's a sense from camp refugees often that, you know, the sort of the Amman people um, get the good jobs, right? Um, and so again, that's a and there's a there's a real tension around that. So that's not a t tension that is about that is external in some sense to the the broad Palestinian refugee community. It's internal, right? Who gets access to um, opportunity within UNRWA? And the the Gaza camp, which was one of the sites that I worked in, people are kind of doubly disadvantaged because. Unlike the, most Palestinians in Jordan, they are not citizens of the country. So there's a real sense that UNRWA is a primary employment opportunity. And they're very frustrated by a sense that they're not, one, not given preference there, but also that there are demands um, for things, especially English language skills, um, that they don't necessarily have. And that don't seem necessary to them for the positions that they're being asked for. It's, it, it, there, there's a lot of conflict or feeling that UNRWA imposes um, conditions on positions that 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 are in some sense designed to dis disadvantage them. Um, but also then occupying the position of being a provider to a community that you are also a part of has the effect of, not shockingly, sort of shifting people's subjectivities. So there's a lot of frustration by UNRWA employees uh, about Palestinian protest uh, directed at UNRWA. And you know, a sense that people um, are asking for too much, they don't understand the limit, the limits of our budget, that we're we're trying to make sure we're trying to make sure that these decisions are made on the fairest grounds, and they should recognize that, and they don't. And the they and the we in those circumstances, everybody is a refugee, right? But it but it has to do probably with where with where you're located and and which um, from which space you speak. Um, so in fact, tensions about humanitarianism and tensions about UNRWA are not just and maybe even not primarily tensions between Palestinians and humanitarian organizations. They are tensions within a Palestinian community. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. It's, it's a very related question. In fact, Bosnia uh, is also with the host countries that treat them very, very differently. You mentioned Jordan, which I hear, and just from you, that it offers citizenship and much more opportunity. Whether in other camps you hear from people kind of expressions of envy or expressions of, uh, you know, oh, should you know those people there have it much, much better than we do? And to what degree does it indicate the uh, willingness to settle where they are, basically, of continue of kind of completely giving up, saying, well, you know, whatever happens, happens. We now want to leave, and let us live in a society where we are anyways kind of linguistically, culturally, religiously similar, and stay put here if possible, like what seems to be happening in. In Jordan, do you hear those discussions? Um, so, for the last point, you don't mainly hear like what we really want, what we hope for. Our our greatest hope is to is to be able to settle here. Um, though there, people do want better circumstances in the places in which they live. But in terms of th of this sort of question about a comparative view across places and camps, and this was definitely something that I talked to people. About. Um, and there is a real, um, there, there, there is a lot of comparative thinking, right? Um, but it's not, that too is not univocal. Like, so um, Lebanon, which is, has um, historically been either the worst or best place, you know, depending on what's, what's been going on politically, but it's been a very difficult 
place for for um, refugees. People would often say they'd sort of talk about Jordan and say, "Well, you know, their material circumstances are better, um, but we have political freedom, and they don't. You know, we can have political expression." And you certainly see. I mean. You see that the iconography of the camps is very different, you know, in from Lebanon to Jordan. Where in Jordan, that political expression is really heavily controlled in a way that it is that it is not in Lebanon. So, you know, people see, um, you know, see those differences as not ha as not being singular. Um, but also, like I remember, you know, um, working in the West Bank, and there were, you know, we often, you know, the West Bank is under Israeli occupation, but they would sort of look to Lebanon as a place of like maybe, you know, we maybe we need to go and be compassionate, and maybe there's an, I have an opportunity to help the, you know, my brethren in these camps, which are so much worse than our camps. So yeah, I mean, people do think about what um, the different kinds of circumstances in which other people are living, and also think about a kind of comparative, um, I mean, this is another side to like a comparative politics of suffering within within the community, and sometimes feeling like um, I have one, I talk about one encounter I have in the book with, with a woman, also in Jedash camp, um, where what she was really saying was that, um, she felt she was not, uh, as, a, as a resident of this camp, whose material conditions are not good, who was vulnerable in, in Jordan in um, a lot of ways, that by being outside of Gaza and not suffering as much as the people who, people who were living in Gaza, and I was talking to her you know, not long after, I think it was the 2009 war, she was sort of saying, I am somehow less, like you know, this question of how do you live as a Palestinian, I'm not living fully as a Palestinian because I am not suffering as much as people in Gaza are suffering. Um, so, so, so in some sense, it's another one of these yes and no's. Yes, so yes, people think a lot about the different conditions in which uh, other people live and think about what it means for them as they, um, as they you know, think about their identities as Palestinians, but also what, what kinds of politics they should pursue, but there's not a singular meaning to that. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question about your. I mean, I, I haven't finished the book, so I'm not really sure if you addressed that at some point or not. But um, I'm, I'm amazed saying, that you that you're already reading it. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering what your view is on the refugee camp as a laboratory to a modernity type of situation. So in terms of not just political experimentation, but also social experimentation and epistemological experimentation. So, you know, I'm not just talking at the policy level and what is being tried and not tried and how it gets exported or not exported to other situations, but also kind of a social scientific <laughs> experimentation with all sorts of economists having experiments and bankers having experiments <laughs> with refugee populations and then trying to see how to best you know, to create best practices for management at the margins or at the extreme, and then, and then we can kind of replicate these knowledges elsewhere. Right. Um, so, yeah. yeah, actually, that, that kind of, Miriam and I were talking before about the, the sort of challenges, like this kind of, uh, the different angles from which people try to imagine technical solutions right. to kind of political problems, and that comes from all sorts of, from all sorts of directions, right? It's, that also doesn't have a single, Single meaning, and I think that one of the things that that this moment um, we see a lot of because there is attention to a kind of global refugee crisis, that there is um, a lot of um, a lot of thinking about what you know the you know the, the ATM card and all of these different ways of, of managing managing the experience um, in a camp um, and. I mean, one of the things that I think is clear to me from, from this research, which again, I think shouldn't, should in some ways is self-evident, but, but I think is not, is that camps, like other spaces, are not simply available for, for experimentation and for people to do what they want with, right? Um, that these are spaces that people who live in them, and then some of the, you know, you could maybe say the, the infrastructure materiality itself sort of push back against whatever kind of um, efforts there are to make them a particular kind of space, to have people use them in particular ways, to have people navigate them 
um, and their lives through them in particular ways. So yes, I think there is a lot of focus on both from a um, technical humanitarian side, but also from a kind of political side. How can we how can we how can we reinvigorate this as a as a space that can let us imagine a different political world? Um, but none of but all of these projects um, kind of get reconfigured when they confront the spaces of the camps themselves. Um, I just want to say in, re yeah. in response because we yeah we were thinking like when does it stay political when is it technical you know how does this re how does the technical reform the political that it makes me think of of humanitarian or, or these kind of cat bonds do you know these cat bonds catastrophe bonds so it's a whole experiment in investing in catastrophe <laughs> and you actually they're bonds that you buy in the hope that that it won't happen but you're investing in that it won't but you, happen but you get paid off when it happens yes. Or does it help? Yes. So it's these crazy things that so are. You get paid if the catastrophe happens. Yes. It's called cluster. The cat bonds, cat catastrophe. Yeah. There's a woman named Susan Erickson who writes about that. But so, so I do think there are these exper technical experiments that are also, I don't know. You're betting on a, you know, you're betting on somebody's life. I mean, you're betting. You're gonna, you're gonna win if they live. You're gonna, you know. I, I, I mean, you kind of they'll, they'll say it as win-win. Like right. they live, you win. <laughs> they die, you win because you make money. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> but so I do think these are spaces of experimentation mm -hmm. in upsetting ways. Um, so, uh, uh, thank you so much for this, Alana. It's a really fascinating conversation. Uh, you mentioned that you were able or were forced in some way to cut the the timeline off because of the Syrian conflict and mm -hmm. the effect of Syrian refugees. Uh, coming into these countries. And Basically, if I was ever going to stop. I, I, right, of course, yeah. <laughs> but but it, does, it does lead me to wonder about Iraqi refugees. Mm. And if there is an effect uh, that you were able, were able to notice about, because there are, as far as I know, significant numbers of Iraqi refugees post-2003 in Jordan, in Syria, and to some extent in Lebanon as well. Is there an interaction happening there? Did you notice an effect, uh, you know, historically, you know, in the way that these things are dealt with? Um, so the one, I mean, one thing, um, this was not something that I was, that I was looking at uh, specifically, but I would certainly hear from people in Jordan, um, Palestinian refugees, a sense of frustration that attention, that, that, thing, that things that they were owed, you know, deserves, were, were being turned in to, uh, to look in another direction, um, and Iraqis would be mentioned, and particularly this, the, for Gazans in Jordan, right, who are not citizens, who ha have uh, you know, a greater need and vulnerability, the sense that, they should, that, that Jordan was opening itself up and creating more opportunity, recognizing the limits of opportunity for mm. Iraqis, but that there was a sense that it was creating more opportunity for Iraqis and not for them. Um, so, but it is, I mean, I do think that, that, that looking at, you know, given that there are also, there are very, the places that one can go and do research in the Middle East are becoming more and more narrow, mm -hmm. um, and so Jordan is in a, you know, mm. there, there's a lot, I think one could do a similar but different kind of project to what I was looking at, which is to look specifically at the sort of layers of humanitarian response and, and population in a place like Jordan, where the, obviously the, the whole shape of the country has been constituted by these um, shifting layers. Mm -hmm. but, but I should also say, and this is, again, not totally responsive to your question, but the camps are not, you know, these are Palestinian refugee camps, but demographically, depending on where they are, many of these camps are extremely mixed, mm -hmm. right? You know, so, that, so they have both other refugees, Iraqi refugees, but also Egyptian laborers or Syrian laborers before there were Syrian refugees. Right? So the, the, these kind, these spaces are not, um, you know, they're not isolated either, you know, sort of materially or demographically. So we're only we're coming to the end, but maybe we can take a few questions, the final ones together, if there are um, back here. Yeah, and you, and is there anything else? Okay. Yeah. So three. so much. Um, so I'll make this brief. Uh, 
Uh, Miriam, when you were talking about how um, those of us that study humanitarianism, we seem to have this lack of grammar, mm. right, about how to speak about it, and then um, fusing that with what Alana was saying, Congress's rather cynical view that defunding UNRWA will lead to destabilization. So I wanted to ask, to what extent sh do we or should we start thinking about humanitarianism as a mode of conflict management, mm -hmm. especially considering how long UNRWA has been in the region. And I mean this in the uh, most base sense, right? If we think about not so much bear life as Gambian does, but maybe political bear life or bear political life that, you know, if you, if you kept them fed, they won't <coughs> uprise, right? Because if we follow that to its logical conclusion, that is, of course, in and of itself, providing a highly political type of solution to this conflict. Great, yeah. And yeah, one more at the back there. Yeah. Hi, um, so Jessica Poor was here yesterday, and mm. her book, The Right to Maine, came out last year, and mm. so she talked a lot about sort of um, the framework of disability as a sort of identitarian politics, sort of thing more um, rights and services from Palestinian Authority in, occupied, in occupied Palestine. And I was curious, um, Due to a similar situation in terms of like um, you know sort of protracted conflicts, lack of resources over like a broad sort of um, stretch of time, if you saw uh, Palestinians in the refugee camps um, resorting to sort of other identifications in their sort of politics and in their interaction with the Murad, for example, like did they use any kind of they obviously identified as refugees and as Palestinians, but did they ever sort of seek more services? through the deployment of sort of a disability, a disabled identity, or was there any other kind of identitarian claims to um, additional services? Yeah, um, well, and that also is double directional, because UNRWA is, you know, these, you know, cat, things like disability, things like um, gender pr gender protection and, and advancement are come from the humanitarian organizations as much as they might come from the, from the community, but, but certainly disability um, is something that has, well actually both disability and gender are, are, have been focuses of 